Great, thank you all for coming. And uh, thank you to Darts, to Darts for hosting me and for uh, in this event together. Sixteen photographic objects cast in a reinforced concrete foundation. Concrete, steel, wood, acrylic, time, and photographic memory. This is the description artist Akram Zatsuri provides of his 2012 work, Time Capsule Castle, commissioned for that year's Documented 13. This description of the constitutive materials would otherwise This description of the constitutive materials would otherwise be unremarkable if it were not for the inclusion of three items, immaterial and speculative photographic memory, time, and the conceptually vague photographic objects. Even more startling is the presentation of the work itself. Time capsule is partially buried in Karlsau Park, Castle, Germany. Four pieces of steel protrude into the sky above from a small gray cement base. The photographic objects are not to be seen as they reside underground nor known unless one was already familiar with the piece and thus their presence below. Zatari's photographs here are spectral for they offer an invisible visibility and latent for these objects are the product and afterlife of trauma, both of which the photograph and trauma threaten to reappear at any time. In tonight's talk, The Right to be Seen, writing after the disaster, I will focus on one mode of artistic production shared amongst many art practices in Lebanon today. These practices take the form of creating and positing archives and images that are latent, inaccessible, and spectral. They are ghostly and they haunt. A refusal to represent in the here and now is, I argue, a crucial mode of representation that acknowledges the 18,000 disappeared after the 1975 to 1990 Lebanese Civil War, and the very real possibility that many of these disappeared still lay below the surface of Beirut and elsewhere. The spectral archive can be seen in the work from four artists that I'll discuss this evening, Zatari's time capsule and video in this house, Lemia Jorge's project, Underwriting Beirut, Matap, and the artist duo Joanna Haji Thomas and Julio George's latent images. All these works anticipate the possibility of testimony to come at a future date and imagine the time that this history can be exhumed, developed, and written. These archives and images are spectral, for we are aware of its presence, variously referred to as an absent present by Mohammed Darwish, a latent image by Jalal Tufik an object in absentia by Walid Sadek, and a night visibility by Jacques Derrida. Representation is itself latent and deferred promissory note for the future. The archive and the work I'll discuss this evening presents as a Janus-like figure, simultaneously here, yet there, visible, yet invisible, withdrawn, yet symptomatic, dead, yet undead. These practices partake in the production of the invisible, sharing of reticence in developing and displaying images in the present, forestalling their presence into the future. Time capsule is part of a lineage of the hidden where Zatari offers a future promise, a note that may never be found, let alone open and seen. His 2005 film, this is a, a still from it, in this house, similarly presupposes the dead and buried but from a temporally different vantage point, one, that, one of discovery and the subsequent excavation of what is missing. In this case, the missing takes the form of a buried letter written by Ali Hashito, in which Zatari sought to recover and document in the film. According to Zatari, in this house aimed to deliver a letter written in 1991 by a former member of the Lebanese resistance, addressed to people that he did not know, people who had fled their house, 
He happened to have occupied their house with his military group for six years. He didn't know who they were. He wanted to leave them a note before withdrawing from the area in 1991, so he wrote a letter and he buried it in their garden, and he never returned to meet them. Zatari was told about the letter in 2002, yet was uncertain if he could find it. Hashito uh, assured Zatari that the letter should still be buried, sitting undisturbed below the ground. This process of excavation is analogous to what we might call the archival act, an act in which one forestalls the erasure of the present by searching for documents, each of which is itself a time capsule. Critic Anthony Downey argues that within this house, there's a literal excavation. With time capsule, there's something buried. In both works, there is this anachronism, something that's out of time, something that's not quite right or not quite in this time. Both Time Capsule and In This House speak to this deferral in its refusal to both be legible and visible. Time Capsule is a museum no one is allowed to visit or even see, strengthening its hold on public attention, a museum that exists in the mental image and social commentary it generates. The photographic objects that he proclaimed to bury below ground at Kralsau Park, Germany, are not photographs at all, at least are not what one would consider to be traditional photographs. They are paintings, 32 in total, each an uneven, poorly painted, of varying hues, varying impasto on unfinished plywood board. The park that provides a subterranean staging for the capsule is a modest inner city park on the western edge of Castle of half a square mile in size and is best known perhaps as the subject of a mid 18th century painting by Johann Heinrich Tischbein the Elder, hunting in Karlsau. Nearby is the planetarium cabinet of astronomy and physics looking to the cosmos while Zatari explores the ground. Inside, they house a 16th century astronomical clock able to confirm the positions of the sun, the moon and the planets one of the earliest of its kind. As an act of preservation, a burial, it is prudent to consider why Zatari chose such a mode of display. What are the, the specific historical conditions that precipitate and facilitate the action of burial as appropriate, indeed relevant artistic response after a time of crisis? Burial is, of course, for the dead, the time capsule buried yet to be discovered at a later date. This action replicates a common sentiment in Beirut that the disappeared reside somewhere between living and dead, an uncanny present absent of which one is aware of yet cannot see, let alone touch. It seems that Zatari's time capsule appears to visibly underwrite the notion of spectrality. There is something buried that resonates, it haunts it's invisible yet present, there exists something that is out of time. Existing out of time can be read through the opening passages of Derrida's text, Spectres of Marx, beginning with an oft-repeated reference to Shakespeare's Hamlet, time is out of joint. The connection is clear, this idea of deferral is central. The reading and understanding of events, for example, the Lebanese civil wars, is delayed both a psychological response to the trauma of war and an imposed legislated amnesia that stems from the 1991 general amnesty law. The subsequent reading of the image in the archive is postponed, sometimes indefinitely. Haunting is historical. Time capsule responds to a specific set of circumstances and subsequent ethical demands. What happens to a museum's collection when the contents come under threat of destruction and disappearance at a time of war, and what ought one to do about it? At the outbreak of war in 1975, Maurice Shahab was then director of the Lebanese Antiquities Department and responsible for the care and upkeep of the National Museum of Beirut's collection. Lebanon was lucky to have a Maurice Shahab, Comments uh, current curator of the museum, 
and Maria Fish. It was Shehab who had the curious and risky idea to conserve the museum's collection by a combination of building false walls in front of large objects, burying others below ground, and concealing smaller objects in the basement, reinforced with steel and cement. The many sarcophagi, now encased in cement, became sarcophagi for the second time over. At this point of time and war, hidden tombs, yet in plain sight, every object within transformed into a funerary object, each and every simultaneously a marker of death, yet with the potential to come back to life post-war. Yet not all could be saved. Since the outbreak of the Lebanese War in 1975, writes Helen uh, Sauter, looting of antiquities resumed on a large scale and headlines like the one running on the front page of the French periodical uh, archaeological in its July-August 1991 issue asking whether Lebanon's world heritage is in the process of being lost have become daily news ever since. The approximately 5th to 6th century Good Shepherd mosaic remained exposed through the duration of the war, its vertical orientation on a wall prohibited covering of the object unlike other mosaics situated on the floor and easily covered under a layer of plastic and cement. Time capsule is not an action, but a script for an action, writes Zatari in the project's catalog. The museum's decision was a perfect act of preservation, he writes, considering the nature of the risks around it. But when seen from our times, that is from a distance, let's say from the future, it also looks like an act of great poetry, particularly in relation to archaeology. So I'm going to show um, just a short clip, maybe five minutes or so, uh, of the installation of Zatari's time capsule in Castle, which will, you know, it gives a bit more form to his project and it also connects it to uh, the National Museum of Beirut, as you'll see. See if this plays. Come on, Lord.
شفتيه لو عقل؟ لا اه هرب اختفى بس اي شيء لهون Twenty years before the outbreak of civil war in Lebanon, travel writer Bruce Conde, in the 1955 travel guide, See Lebanon, 
articulates the at times mundane quotidian experience of visiting a museum, the sense in stark contrast to the subsequent occupation of the museum, offering a sniper's nest to its many visitors. Lebanon's National Museum, containing outstanding royal treasures of the ancient city-states, he writes, is a must for Lebanese and foreign visitors alike. It is one of the principal showplaces of Beirut. Condé continues, the museum building itself is streamlined and spacious in modern pharaonic architecture, symbolic of Lebanon's extremely ancient connection with the pharaohs of e Egypt, some of which whose treasures sent to Lebanese city-states of antiquity are preserved therein. In fact, the entire theme of the museum is to play up the earliest periods of Lebanon's 7,000-year-old history so that items from the Byzantine period onward are not generally featured. Condé also notes that in the basement are to be found the finest Phoenician, Greek, and Roman sarcophagi uh, that were all discovered in Lebanon, as well as other funerary material portending what is to come. Lamia George's 2013 project, Underwriting Beirut's Mataf, reimagines the National Museum of Beirut as offering a time capsule of the history of the war. On this project, George notes that she likes the idea of digging into different layers of history to create poetic form. This work, like Zatsuri's time capsule and video in this house, stages spectrality within the project, which consists of 10 spectral haunting photographs made or more accurately received at Mataf. This is one of the 10. Also a sketch of the sniper's hole burrowed through the museum wall and its dimensions and a reconstruction of the inverse of the hole that takes form as a 100 kilogram sculpture which George terms a poetic reformulation. The museum haunts for the Mataf Barbier crossing was the site of countless kidnappings and killings during the 15 year war. The museum itself witnessed a revolving cast of occupiers, armies and militia groups, each vying to control the surrounding district in which George lives today. The small opening to the Good Shepherd mosaic for a sniper's access offers another layer of history. In this series, Underwriting Beirut, George uh, explores how a city may itself be underwritten in both senses of insurance and assurance of the material, architectural stock, and the persons, families, neighborhoods housed within. You can underwrite a house, but can you underwrite Beirut? In all its histories, constructions, destructions, iterations, and erasures, what form would such a policy take? Former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafi Kariri, assassinated in 2005, perhaps portended the underwriting of Beirut in his anticipation of the foreclosure of Beirut, given the destruction from the civil war and subsequent purchase and demolition of the entire city center through his development company, Solidir. For Georges, Beirut presents a palimpsest in which layer upon layer of history is built, each inscribed over another, thus requiring a practice of excavation to exhume the below layers, a practice that may, be, may perhaps be understood as underwriting. Her project names a space of appearance, the visible museum constructed in the phronic style of the Egyptian revival between 1930 and 1937 while marking a place of disappearance of both objects looted by its many occupants and civilians kidnapped at the perilous crossing. During the war, the museum and surrounding Mataf area was occupied from varied sectarian groups, militaries, including the Syrian army and the IDF, and militia, including the Lebanese armed forces, the PLO, Mal, Lebanese Communist Party, and others. Etymologically, Matov simultaneously marks a space for the seat of the muses while offering a gift or a treasure. Whatever went missing through the occupation of both the museum and city was simply elided or erased 
not just from the collection, but crucially from history, at least from record. There is no registration, no index of extant objects prior to the war, or if there was an index, it is also missing. Not trained as an archeologist, the museum was reluctant to provide George with any more access than other than that of the Good Shepherd Mosaic. She speculates that she was provided access only because the mosaic was soon to go on display. The Emir Shahab, lauded for his remarkable efforts in preserving much of the collection, was confronted with some difficulty in preserving the Good Shepherd mosaic, given its placement. Other mosaics in the National Museum of Beirut were laid horizontal on the floor, allowing for easier preservation. They were simply covered with a layer of plastic and cemented over. Like a palimpsest, no storage, the project incorporates various layers of time and existence, creating links between the traces that record the previous realities of such places and the fictions that reinvent them. The uncovered mosaic bore witness to a continually revolving cast while being exposed and affected by their actions. The story goes that when the Lebanese Civil War broke out, a man snuck into the Good Shepherd's garden found in the National Museum of Beirut. He hid amongst the trees and would indiscriminately snipe any passerby, be they animal or human, through a black hole he specifically made for this purpose. The skulk wasn't the stranger of whom the Rabani brothers told of in their works of art, nor was this the stranger who valiantly fought our Lebanese right wing. Rather, he was a sniper from our very own homeland, and his targets were his own people, and his war was a civil one par excellence. This small sniper's aperture provides an open vantage point onto the Matov Barbier crossing, then one of the central crossing points for civilians that also traversed the east-west green line. Because of its strategic location along the front, great storage, the crossing and its surroundings became the site of rampant killings and kidnappings, as well as skirmishes between militia and various nations' armies struggling for its control. From this vantage point, you or I, or a sniper, peers upon the crossing with an extended 180 degree garden view. Both the title and content are Jorge's short video that plays nearby this photograph. And from the negative space of the whole, the cement model of the space in between the relative safety of the encased protected sniper and the vulnerable open civilian. Resting on a plinth across from the video, this sculptural cement block titled Object of War exhibits the close proximity between sniper and potential victim as not one of several hundred feet, but rather only a few. Instead of constructing a replication of the whole from a mold, Jorge reimagined the negative space through the use of photographs and careful measurement to create a 3D model that provided a blueprint for the reconstruction of the empty space. This process is triggered by the mnemonic monument capability of the museum as a site of loss, trauma, disappearance, and death. The model's title, takes the name after George's film series, Objects of War, 2000 to ongoing, wherein she interviews subjects who lived through the Civil War, asking them to bring a significant, memorable object of war to the interview. The space of absence, technologically reconstructed and given form by George, is a mnemonic chain between nothing, self indicative of not just absence in terms of loss, but it disappeared too. And the imagining of being at a time of war in the here and now of the National Museum. Engaging such connections enacts a process of both recollection and reconstruction akin to the writing of history. Object of War signals Andreas Hussein's urban imaginary in which a building may put different things in one place, memories of what was there before, imagined alternatives to what there is. What unfolds at the site of the National Museum is a curious interplay between the absent fragments of the mosaic and the presence of a ruined remainder, itself providing an allegory of the various characters and militia occupying the site over the 15 year period. 
In other words, this is to say that the Good Shepherd Mosaic asks us to consider the relationship between the fragment, the object of war, and the whole, providing a second allegory for the writing of history itself. Walter Benjamin argues that just as mosaics preserve their majesty despite their fragmentation into capricious particles, so philosophical contemplation is not lacking in momentum. Both are made up of the distinct and the disparate, and nothing could bear more powerful testimony to the transcendent force of the sacred image and the truth itself. The residual fragments of the Good Shepherd mosaic as capricious particles are forever gone, likely pushed through onto the promenade many years ago. By reconstructing the wall in between the mosaic and outside world from cement, the very same material used by Shahab to hide yet preserve other pieces within the collection, George calls upon the necessary gaps, absences, mistellings, fictions, and tracings in the writing of any historical narrative. The absent tiles were not restored, just as George made no attempt to recreate the tiles on her sculptural object of war. Where object of war is a material positive of negative space, her accompanying series of 10 photos titled Views of Museum Square are negatives. The black and white photograms are the inverse of how we see the world and exude spectral, ghostly apparitions in the space out front of the National Museum. These fugitive, seemingly fleeting images are received, not made, upon the light-sensitive photo paper when exposed to the world, a process that recalls Man Ray's rayographs. Yet much like the capricious particles of the mosaic that demand to be read in their minutiae, Man Ray's rayographs are of the micro, whereas Jorge's series is macro, an attempt to capture not the minor detail, but instead the extant forms in and around the Matoff Barbier crossing. In presenting us with these spectral facades, Jorge imagines the surrounding area as a cemetery, void of the living as marked by the withdrawal and lack of any human subjects in these photographs. The National Museum's large collection of funerary material and sarcophagi appears to transcend and avoid containment by the museum walls. These images are a night visibility, the black and white negative of white presence on a black background simulates the visible landscape made possible by night vision goggles. Here, the specter of past generations, of those killed and disappeared, the invisible visible, the presence of humans who are otherwise absent, is itself imprinted on the photogram paper. Photography is a mode of bereavement, argues Eduardo Cadava. It speaks to us of mortification. Even though it still remains to be thought, the essential relation between death and language flashes up before us in a photographic image. These blurred photograms, each of varying legibility, appear to be in a state of becoming. It is as though they are developing in this very moment in front of our eyes. They are each a latent image in privation, holding and hiding information stored somewhere within the frame to be perhaps discovered at a later date when fully developed and made legible. Yet we know this time will never come. On the 23rd of February, 2017, I visited the National Museum of Beirut. The Good Shepherd Mosaic was on view, as were some 30-odd sarcophagi. On the upper floor, there is a vitrine on display that contains a small selection of curious, deformed, discolored, dismembered, and burned objects, each twisted and torqued in its own unique way. The didactic reads, Objects damaged during the Lebanese war. The terrible condition of these objects, as well as the fusion of metal, ivory, glass, and stone, are the result of high temperatures reached during a fire caused by the shelling of the storage area. The exhibition of these objects points toward the possibility of a slightly open door to the annals of the museum, a door that was certainly closed at the time of Jorge's project. 
By acknowledging the existence of these objects, the museum begins to recognize itself as a site of conflict. In a time in which post-war trauma necessitates a continual denial of reconciliation and acknowledgement of horrific crimes committed in war, the display takes on a defiant yet hopeful purchase of history. These objects are remaindered capricious particles that will, hopefully, constellate and form an object of war that is itself a mosaic. This display is a response to Georges' speculative inquiry, who asks, given the absence of a nation of shared ancestry in Lebanon, how can the subject of collective history and identity be addressed? Wonder Beirut is a project by Joanna Hedgy Thomas and Halil Jorej that began in 1997 and ceased at the outbreak of the 2006 Israel-Lebanon War and is rather well known outside of Lebanon. In addition to one of the Wonder Beirut's light boxes here in the collection at Darat al Fanun, two notable texts, Susan Buck Morris's Thinking Past Terror, Islamism uh, and Critical Theory on the left, and TJ Demos, The Migrant Image, employ the striking burnt, photo, uh, burnt postcards of a once idyllic Beirut taken by the fictitious photographer Abdullah Farah, a creation of Hedgy Thomas and Jorge as cover images. Today, I'm more interested in one subseries of Wonder Beirut called Latent Images, Drawer of Films. In the May 2015 issue of Art Forum, they write, for 10 years between 1997 and 2006, we took photographs of our daily life in Beirut. We never developed these images, however. Instead, we wrote descriptions of each snapshot in a series of notebooks, creating a photographic diary that could be read but not seen. It was an attempt to capture the feelings of latency that haunted Beirut an effort to show the complexity of the city, the density of situations, the aftermath of the war, and its consequences for representation. The latent images produced by Haji Thomas and George were constructed also in response to the 1991 general amnesty. These images, these images are not images in the present, but rather they're images in wait to, to be developed at a later date. The work they reference in the art forum piece, latent images, films from November 4th, 1998 to April 11th, 1999, consists of a C print of a drawing, of a drawer, sorry, containing approximately 150 undeveloped rolls of 35 millimeter and 120 uh, medium format film. We do not see what is on these rolls, however. Hedgy Thomas and Georges, through their interlocutor Farah, provide a description of some of the images so they inform us that he calls contact sheets. <coughs> and these are some of them, I, don't, I know that you can't read those, but they're very banal, like auto portraits in the mirror, impassive attitude, but interiorized feeling of euphoria, auto portrait in the mirror, impassive attitude, but interiorized feeling of hunger, and so on. Walter Benjamin, in what would be one of his final essays, noted a latent posthumous shock experience invoked by the camera and located within the photograph itself. In his essay on some motifs in Baudelaire, he argues that with regard to countless movements of switching, inserting, pressing, and the like, the snapping by the photographer had the greatest consequences. Henceforth, a touch of the finger sufficed to fix an event for an unlimited period of time. The camera gave the moment a posthumous shock. Latency marks a gap between the event and the posthumous, sh the posthumous shock that comes after the event, the making of a photograph at the press of a button. Yet in what sense are Hedgy Thomas and George's photographs made? For while the photograph is taken, is neither developed nor printed in the latent images series. Rather, these images provide the possibility to usher in a posthumous shock were they to be developed. Just as the latent images produced by Hedgy Thomas and George lay in wait, just as the sealed, once undiscovered letter 
by Eli Hashito and Akram Zatri's in this house lay buried, only to be later found, photographed, and documented. The photograph always provides the possibility of a shock were it to be transformed into a picture at any point during a lifetime, thwarting decay of the exposure on the receptive surface. This latency between the production of the exposure and the developing into a picture is homologous to the delay between the occurrence of a historical event and our experience of the event and the subsequent writing of history. Crucial to the development of this new kind or mode of writing, central to the work I've discussed, is the reorganization of history as bringing to bear a traumatic element or a traumatic event that is itself central to writing. This recognition of trauma as constitutive brings the writing subject into history itself, a blurring of historical facticity with interpersonal trauma that is at times mistaken for fiction. Trauma in the traumatic event is itself delayed, deferred, latent, what Freud would call afterwardness. This latent response, the temporally deferred effect, is a historical element by way of inserting a relation between past and present and future, or when will this trauma reappear into the individual, a temporality traditionally understood as historiographic. In turn, this traumatic event is part of the secret history of the subject and a whole people or nation against which the official account of its past is to be comprehended as an alibi or sublimation in response to guilt feelings derived from the original act. The latent images of Hedgy Thomas and George operate within a chasm between the development and representation of the image, making it legible in the present, and the withdrawn non-image, what George D.D. Huberman identifies as a fold between the imminent obliteration of the witness and a certain unrepresentability of testimony. These deferred images exist as pure potentiality outside of time and thus to be read, understood, and written about when necessary, when the Benjaminian emergency so arises. Something remains that is not the thing, but a scrap of its resemblance. Something very little, a film, remains the process of annihilation. That something, therefore, bears witness to a disappearance while simultaneously resisting it, since it becomes the opportunity of its possible remembrance. Not yet developed, yet present in the form of a sea print of the undeveloped rules, these images appear to limb a balance between full presence and absolute absence. Our imagined photographer, Abdullah Farah, refers to these works as the invisible image or the image in the text. Latent images is Hedgy Thomas and George's preferred term. Of course, they're the ones that name all three. It is thus unsurprising that historian Craig Larkin notes that many Lebanese youth employ strategies of forgetfulness in avoidance of any possibility of future conflict. None are freed from traumas of the past in spite of few having experienced the war. Larkin argues that the haunting power of a scarred, fragmented landscape still persists today in terms of sites and ruins, spatial organization and narratives, all of which become normalized in everyday life. Crucially, amidst times of political instability and heightened tension, such spaces of imaginative connection and shared trauma are not only strengthened and reworked, sustaining prejudices and sectarian political differentiation, but also offer protection, communal, uh, communal solidarity, and a sense of belonging. For those youth who do seek to distance themselves from Lebanon's destructive past, this comes at a cost, a disavowal of history and a dislocation from the present. The shared experience of trauma and attempts to mitigate said experiences and shared histories by way of forgetting ought to heed the concerns of writer Elias Hurry, who warns that civil wars are not to be erased from reality or from memory. They are only reborn or reincarnated, banished from the written 
they take to the spoken, erased from memory, they colonized the subconscious. The post-war Lebanese aphorism, no victor, no vanquished, enshrines in legal policy one concern in which the formation of an official history may develop in response to the public's guilt. Instead, there is no narrative at all. Thank you. So, questions? <laughs> Is that a question or is we stretching? <laughs> First of all, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, Jeff, your presentation reminded me of this quote from an article I came across um, a few days ago. So that quote reads, my surgical reading of fiction is meant to officiate writing as a form of architecture to understand that perceived realities are non-fictions, are not non-fictions, but in fact manifested fictions that have been legalized through a particular networking with power. Simply put, perceived realities are like project proposals that have been funded enough to afford operating costs. And at the time of perception, there is sustain their sustainability as active, continuous projects. Um, I was wondering whether you can share your thoughts with us on the counter archive yeah. in relation to fiction and power, and whether you think that um, latent narratives can be fictions in their own right. And so part of this project responds yeah. to this really sort of common stance from lots of uh, uh, critics who, in my mind, misread a lot of this work as just being or working in a purely fictitious mode. And, you know, part of my reply has always been that, you know, the problem with fiction is that a lot of these works are responding to people that are no longer here, do not exist, and so on. And so there's this sort of, uh, you know, gap between their appearance, they're no longer in front of us, and their disappearance. And so it's easy to just sort of say, oh, you know, these histories are made up, they're fictions, um, you know, Abdullah Farah, the photographer, it doesn't exist, which is true, but it seems to me that, like, the necessity of that fiction is actually to, you know, counter the sort of historical archive of the war that, you know, might be considered nonfiction, but it's only, you know, one narrative. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I find that a lot of these artists that I'm discussing here, um, you know, these counter archives that they construct, it might appear like they are fictitious because part of it does involve the creation of uh, characters and personas uh, and, and even the creation of certain events. But it seems to me that, for example, you know, there's, a, a general amnesty in Lebanon pre-1991, where you know everyone was absolved of any crimes to do with the war. So after that, it's just this sort of sense of amnesia, this forgetting, right? And so with that, rather than thinking of artists as actually writing fictions, or maybe it is just a series of you know a multitude of fictions, hundreds, thousands, however many. But then I would also say that you could probably apply that to any sort of historical narrative. Yeah. So do you think that latency is productive in and of itself? Um, I think so, because latency, uh, part of this project reads latency through the work of Freud as mm. you know, a trauma that will always be delayed. The event happens, and there's a latency between that event and then you know, the, the trauma that comes after after the events mm -hmm. that occurs. And so, you know, that's where I think that, uh, like Hadji Thomas and George, their latent images just sort of call attention to this gap mm -hmm. and that, you know, we have these photos that document times during the war, mm -hmm. but we don't know how we feel about it today. We don't know how the subjects feel. Maybe some point in the future, um, you know, there's that latency between 
what happens and when they would be developed, which is, you know, as I say here, sort of homologous or parallel to trauma, mm-hmm. right? And so you sort of wait. And part of it is also uh, sort of playing into Walter Benjamin's idea of photography, where, like I mentioned, that posthumous shock, that latency, that uh, moment where, you know, you take a picture, but it's always going to come. You know, there's, it has to be slightly delayed, right? And so, you know, these images, if we were to develop them one day, um, well, who knows what they would show outside of their very brief descriptions. But I think that difference between the developing and the picture that we get is similar to the sort of that gap, that trauma mm-hmm. that would come after. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you as well, Jeff. You allowed me to see the work of Akram Zatari at uh, Documenta. Mm -hmm. I was there, I looked for it everywhere, and I could never find it. It was, now I understand understand why. I I didn't understand why the back, he used wood, not cement. No, so it's wood, but then the the cement is poured in and encased, Ah. sort of entombed, and wrapped around it, right? And so... Like, I sort of understand that to be similar to, say, the sarcophagi in the National Museum, where you have those wrapped in cement and slowly uh, sort of falling apart inside, but still protected from the outside, if that's the case. It's a very good point. Uh, That same year, you had as well, in terms of memory and images, uh, the work of uh, Emily Jasser, Mm ex-Libris, that documented all the uh, f- uh, f- yeah. photographs and photographs of books yeah. that disappeared from, that were taken away from during the yeah. 48th yeah. Uh, Palestinian war. So you must have seen it as well. I have, and, yeah, that they, and it wasn't it it presented was, in the castle. Uh, in, like in, in the tower, war. yeah. In the tower. So how do you compare this uh, uh, latency or memorizing uh, mm-hmm. uh, disasters? I would say, yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. And it seems to me that there's, like, both of them come out of the necessity to archive, right? The necessity to own one's material, um, you know, the collection of the people. And then with Emily Jasser's project, where, you know, she was able to get access to what um, uh, the Israeli archive calls abandoned property. But the, is, a, the access, you know, secretly. She put yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it. On a, a ah. Nokia yeah. s- a tiny her, phone. Uh, yeah. 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 And so, you know, she was lucky to have, you know, just that sort of sliver of access. But it points to how, one, I mean, this so called abandoned property needs to go back to Palestine. Um, you know, people has to have control of their own archive, clearly. Um, which is sort of similar to the necessity to, in a sense, archives one, archive one's collection in the National Museum by, you know, covering it in cement, by hiding it to make sure that something similar doesn't happen, right? So that these, that these sarcophagi, these, uh, sort of works and mosaics don't also go missing, um, at, at sort of that time of conflict. Do you, do you feel that uh, the Palestinian artists are representing uh, um, uh, forcefully the, you know, f- um, the loss of memory mm. and the state memory you know, that is imposed on them? Yeah, yeah. There's uh, such a huge problem with, I mean, there's definitely uh, you know, attempts to do that. Uh, Emily Jasser, obviously, one doing that. And there's such a huge problem of access where now you also have uh, a, a, a body of Israeli academics uh, like Rona Sela and Ariel Azule, um, who are, you know, documenting these, these uh, sort of bad property and other things in the archive by way of them just having access to it. And so there's that sort of question of like, well, you know, how, how is it your right to document it when, you know, you are the ones that stole it? So, um, yeah. so I, it's, I, I guess, you know, part of the problem is actually you run up against, like, how 
Like, when will these archives come back to Palestine? And uh, I'm sorry to be uh, to ask too many questions, but th this question comes from the fact that Jalal Tawfir he speaks of uh, surpassing disaster for Lebanon, mm. and he doesn't apply it to Palestine. Mm. I had argued with him always that, in, in that text. Uh, that in the tense, disaster. how yeah. come uh, do you, uh, would you? Do you yeah. care to comment on that? Um, I so I, I mean all I would say sort of about uh, uh, two weeks work and withdrawal disaster is there's something very he I mean he does talk there's a little bit in it about Palestine but it's like an eighty page text and it, Palestine gets maybe three pages he spends more time on uh, uh, Hiroshima Ron Moore the, the Elaine Renee's film and so on. I don't, I don't know, maybe that's just a, a blind spot in his work because I'm not even sure in his many other books if he even talks about Palestine much. Um, I, I think his idea of a withdrawal of tradition surpassing disaster absolutely applies to uh, the situation in Palestine because it's that same uh, you know, withdrawal of Palestinian historical institutions after, after Nakba. So I think... I mean, I guess he, he's so focused on Lebanon and that's sort of enough to sustain the project in a way. Yeah, but he doesn't, yeah, but, but so focused on Beirut. What is the artist, as a Palestinian artist, think that uh, I don't want to use the word archive because I find it as if it's a foreclosed history mm -hmm. and it's very important to visit that material from the past and engage with it in the present, but I'm not wanting to think of it yeah. as a, an archive. It's like a, a, a still a living history, and then I want to keep activating it yeah. at all time. It's not something in the past because that past is our present. So I don't know if you have I, a comment. No, on that. I, I agree entirely with that, and I guess it's sort of coming up against uh, different newer conceptions of the archive, where you know. The most sort of common idea of the archive uh, comes from Foucault in, where he writes, in the historical a priori, where he writes about the archive as being the basis of sort of uh, institutionalizing um, uh, legal statutes and so on, right? So you have to have control of your own archive to be able to write law and say enact violence against the population. But I think now there's ideas of the archive being developed that do sort of see the archive as something that is very um, uh, mutable, um, not just tangible, but also maybe a bit more conceptual in that it, it isn't just a, a document that has a stamp and a date on it from a particular past, but a document that can be often, I hate to use the term, but like activated maybe through the use of whether it's historians or artists. Um, in the early 2000s, I think in 2004, um, the, the art historian and critic Hal Foster wrote about the archival impulse and sort of this archival turn that is happening in contemporary art in 2004, um, where you know more and more artists are not just uh, like paying attention to the art to the archive and using older documents, but really you know bringing them into their practice and trying to sustain us in a sense to still you know write that history not just of say Nakba but and I mean and also to see Nakba is not just 48 but of course that's similar to the archives that sort of ongoing you know Nakba still today yeah, that's 70 years any more questions yes, one question. do you know anything about the uh, uh, photo archive of uh, Walid Raad that has disappeared in 48 from Palestine and it was practically stolen and now uh, around 3,000 images are at the Ecole Biblique in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He was a Lebanese photographer living in Palestine. He has documented a lot of Palestine. I was there last year at the Ecole Biblique and had access to this, this incredible yeah. photo archive and part of it is in Lebanon. Um, with the Palestinian uh, Institute, Palestine Institute. Oh, okay. I don't know if you have... Uh, no, no, um, definitely have Because this is almost like yeah. this open history, open yeah. of uh, Palestine. It, it, well, there, there's also quite a collection, of, of course, of the, the IPS of documents that... One of my later chapters actually talks about 
um, how in 82 in Beirut, the Institute of Palestine Studies was actually looted and bombed during the Israeli occupation and lots of these photographs then. So, you know, it doesn't just happen in, say, 48, but also in 82, you get stolen and you know, back in, in Israel. Good. Thank you. Thank you.